Thank you very much. I thought maybe I would parse the title of our session here. Global, well, yeah, that's big enough. Um, short and medium term, uh, that's pretty complete. Uh, oil market, so that's supply and demand and prices and inventories and refining and geopolitics, infrastructure, government policy. Gee, I don't know whether we can actually fill up all of 45, oops, 40 minutes with that. Uh, so I think I'll join the, the Stern Bureau initiative and we'll call it the oil and gas market outlook. I'm kidding, by the way. <laughs> this, this is indeed um, a set of people that uh, um, I've worked with, um, sometimes uh, in more than one place, um, but it's a group that I think is immersed in the way that oil markets work, um, not just the physical, but also the financial side of markets, uh, working for banks, being in charge of making forecasts and things like that. The way I'm gonna parse the time is I'm gonna give them about a third of the time, which is more like 10 rather than 15 minutes now, um, to give you just the high points of what they think the major issues are. Then we'll do a little inter interaction and I have a couple of questions for them and then we'll get to your questions at the very end. So with that, um, I will start with, uh, with Anton Half from the International Energy Agency who has my old job there in fact. Uh, and then we'll go to Catherine and then we'll go to Jan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, uh, to, for inviting me. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. The previous discussions were terrific, so it's very high. It set the, the bar very high. Um, this morning, we had a bit of a semantics discussion. Uh, is the word revolution really appropriate? Uh, it, does it sound too unpleasant, or is it uh, overused as a term? And my, my view is, um, <clears throat> Whatever the term is, uh, we see very dramatic changes in the market, very large-scale changes uh, affecting the oil market in, on many different fronts at the same time. Um, this is a very significant process of transformation, and there will be uh, winners and losers in this process. Not, you know, it may be progress for some, but it might be the opposite of progress for others. Uh, and this raises all kinds of challenges for the industry, for the market, and also for policymakers and people who focus on energy security. Um, <clears throat> I think there's more than one revolution. There's at least three I can think about uh, regarding the oil market. The first two revolutions uh, are kind of obvious and have been very much uh, in the spotlight. So the first one, I think, is the, the geopolitical revolution, the Arab Spring Revolution. This is not necessarily the one that we're the most comfortable talking about, uh, and we don't necessarily have much to say about it. You know, at the IEA, we're not in the, in the business of making political forecasts. We can't really add much analysis to this, but it's there. It's very significant. It's very large scale. It has an impact on the market. Um, we've seen disruptions on a large scale since 2011. We see disruptions today on a very significant scale. So this is not something that we can sweep under the rug. Uh, it's, it's a very large scale development and it's gonna stay with us for some time. It's not something that's gonna disappear overnight. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly long term process which involves uh, change, risks, and, and impacts on prices. The, the second revolution uh, is also one that's been very much in the spotlight. Uh, it's the uh, supply revolution in North America, or perhaps in the Americas as a whole, if we include Brazil in the mix. Brazil has been disappointing so far, but there's a lot of promise, and eventually it will deliver. So this also uh, is a big deal. Uh, we, we talked a lot about it. Uh, what I would only say in this short uh, format is maybe emphasize or re-emphasize some of the points that Fatih mentioned this morning, which is that we don't see the surge in supply from the Western Hemisphere, from uh, North America or from the Americas, as necessarily a threat to OPEC producers as a group. Uh, we, don't, we don't think OPEC will be a loser in this process, even though there's been some speculation that this raises a challenge for OPEC and OPEC will have to make room for this supply. We don't see that as really happening, at least not in the short term. The new supply has really been offset by disruptions elsewhere. Last year we had a record number of disruptions. 
We have less dis disruptions this year, but we uh, maybe not so much, so, so much less, really. Uh, there, there's still a lot of uncertainty and, and risks. Um, and um, we think that OPEC oil is very much needed. We stay needed in the market that investment in OPEC capacity will be very much required. Um, we're not really sure what demand is doing. We've, been, we've grown now accustomed to the idea of a slowdown in uh, OECD demand growth, even a, a contraction in OECD demand growth. But the OECD economies have been in a fairly uh, bad state for some time, but they're coming out of the crisis. You know, uh, US economy is growing, uh, Europe is out of recession, Japan is, is, spring, is, is rebounding. So we might be surprised on the upside uh, as far as demand is concerned. Uh, also, when we talk about OPEC, uh, oftentimes we focus on our idea of the call on OPEC, the call on OPEC crude plus stock change, but that's not the whole picture, obviously. OPEC is about a lot more than crude. OPEC countries are becoming large refiners, large petrochemical uh, producers. Uh, they're very large NGL and, and non-conventional crude producers, not necessarily included in the call on OPEC. So it's a lot more than that. Uh, and, and stock change is something that we measure very poorly outside of the OECD. For instance, this year in the first half, we had about a million barrels per day of unaccounted, unaccounted for uh, changes, uh, the, the miscellaneous to, to balance in our uh, supply and demand uh, tables. That largely rep probably represents uh, demand for storage in all countries for minimum operating levels associated with new uh, storage and uh, midstream uh, facilities. So it's a very large development. Uh, the other thing, there's also some misconception about the idea of spare capacity. In our balances, we have a very large OPEX nominal spare capacity in the next few years. Now, going back to levels that we haven't seen since the 1990s when the price was $20. But uh, what does this capacity really mean? It's kind of a blunt uh, conceptual instrument. Uh, this capacity is not necessarily all available to the market. If we uh, think of Iranian capacity, for instance, it's not really there for the market to be, to be uh, accessed. So the, the real capacity immediately available to the market might actually be significantly smaller than this. But the third revolution, which has been less in the, in the spotlight, is the revolution in the midstream and downstream uh, sectors, in refining, in transportation, and storage. And this is a very large development, which I just touch on briefly, but we tend to see this industry, midstream and downstream, as a sideshow. And in our view, it's really moving to become a, a centerpiece a segment of the oil, of the oil industry. Uh, there's tremendous capacity growth in the global refining industry, uh, 9.5 million barrels in our admittedly bullish forecast for the next five years, a lot more than supply growth and a lot more than demand growth. There were also significant changes in the uh, geographical distribution of capacity. There's new uh, refining hubs emerging. India, Russia, the Middle East, China somewhat accidentally is becoming a large export-oriented, uh, uh, potentially export-oriented refinery uh, center. Um, the U.S. has become a very large product exporter as well. This, of course, is raising challenges for some in the industry, particularly in Europe. There's going to be losers there. Uh, hard to predict exactly where and who will be a loser, but there's going to be some, some, uh, some damage, uh, undoubtedly. But significantly, this is not just about location and capacity. It's also about the role of the refining industry in the supply chain. Uh, we are moving from a model where crude was traded on a long haul basis, but where the product business was a regional or, or local business, and this is changing. We're seeing a decrease in crude trade, despite the forecast increase in demand, and a significant increase in long haul product trade. Uh, this will come with uh, other changes at the same time as the refining industry increasingly uh, competes with other sources of liquids, biofuel, LPG, uh, gas for transport. Finally, in the midstream, there's been a very dramatic but poorly recorded uh, expansion of capacity, uh, both to meet new supply requirements in North America and also new demand uh, in all kinds of countries, including countries that are virtual black boxes as far as statistics go, like Africa. Uh, there's been very large-scale restructuring of the midstream industry, which is becoming, which is moving from an integrated cost center to an independent uh, profit-oriented industry. So this will have uh, 
consequences for uh, the role of trading in the global supply system for prices, for volatility, and for security. Did he leave anything out, uh, Catherine or Rian? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's why I let him go first. Um, I think Catherine has a couple of other issues that she wanted to add to this, and then we'll get into some areas where I know he's going to shut up because it's going to say price. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be here. I think my last time at, at Oil & Money was when I worked for Energy Intelligence. Um, I want to just throw out a couple of additional themes um, that I think are important to the market right now. One is that uh, volatility has been extremely low in, in the oil and gas markets. And uh, sitting on a trading floor lately, it almost feels like it's the end of volatility. And um, I know that whenever anyone throws anything like that out there, the, the end of history or something like that, they're usually proven wrong very, very quickly. So if that happens to me today, then all the traders in the room can, can thank me later, uh, because that's been a challenge for traders, is this very low volatility. But I think there are some reasons for it in both the oil and the gas market that, that have a lot to do with the, the shale or tide oil revolution. Um, on the oil side, one thing that's quite notable, and there, there are many sort of second order consequences of tight oil that, that we can and probably will talk about today, but one is that this is a much more quickly price elastic type of production than the large conventional plays that, that we knew in the past that took a lot of time and money to start, but then once they started, they went on for years and years without much more effort. Uh, and that's not how tight oil works. It, it comes on quite quickly, but it's very drilling intensive. You have to keep drilling to, to keep it going. And what that says to me is that uh, it will be much more quickly price elastic. Now, uh, in addition to that, at least for the moment, I think that the Saudis are doing a very good job of very precisely meeting the market's call on their crude. Uh, now, the bullish take on this, and, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the bullish take, because I know Jan's going to take care of that. But the bullish take is that for the last couple of years, even though global oil demand growth has been pretty mediocre, it's taken at various periods of time record salty production for months in a row to keep prices from going above $120, despite all this tremendous growth in North America, without which prices uh, ostensibly would have been even higher. So I think that that's the bullish take here. But broadly speaking, we do seem to be pretty range bound in, in an 80 to 120 sort of range for oil. Natural gas in North America, uh, I, I would argue, has a, a situation now, and probably for at least the next couple of years, where both supply and demand are extremely price elastic. Uh, and that means that natural gas, too, seems to be caught in this sort of 250 to 450 range. My bias on oil has been to the higher side of the range. My bias in gas has been to the lower end over the last couple of years and, and currently, but both markets are quite range bound. Now, that's been one challenge for the trade over the last couple of years at a time when the financial trade has had a whole lot of other challenges to contend with at the same time. Uh, Post-2008 crisis, we're in a very, very different credit environment. And there's been obviously some regulatory fallout from, from that crisis as well that has moved much of the trade to, uh, to clearing. To, so no longer uh, bilateral credit agreements between two parties, but to the cleared trade. Now, all of these implications, I would argue, have uh, done a whole lot for price uh, discovery or price transparency, but I question how much they've done for true liquidity in these markets. And in many ways, the financial markets have become more challenging to trade. Now, as a result of that, there's now more and more competitive value in a proprietary supply chain in the physical trade and the information that comes with that proprietary supply chain. So uh, infrastructure really has sort of been the, the topic of the last couple of years, and I think will continue to be the topic of the next couple of years. And that's really where the value is, both uh, in, the physical, in the physical trade for, for producers as, as well as traders and merchants, I think. Um, now, uh, given the, the degree of changes that we've seen, and, and Antoine touched on many of them, we've seen changes in the way that, uh, that product moves around the world. We've seen uh, fragmentation of refined product specifications. We've seen a tremendous change in the, the quality of the crude slate uh, around the world and, and uh, very much counter to expectations. And given all of these changes, uh, we, we've had a lot of new infrastructure requirements. And I think one lesson learned is that there's a tremendous amount of value in optionality when it comes to infrastructure. And one of the ways we learned this lesson uh, quite unexpectedly was from rail. 
Uh, rail provides a tremendous amount of optionality to shippers, both uh, geographic optionality, volume optionality, and timing optionality. And they, I think that people have found so much value in that that they're now actually seeming a little bit commitment shy when it comes to big, what I would call door-to-door -door infrastructure projects. So I, I think that a lot of these changes has made the market rethink how product gets to its end user and really how to optimize that process. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. By the way, uh, Catherine is from CIBC, the Canadian International Bank for Commerce. Jan is from uh, Credit Suisse. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Jan, we've left a little bit for you, I think. Yeah? No, it's uh, most kind of you indeed. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you all for sticking with us quite this long. And, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it was 1998, I believe, that I was last in front of uh, Mrs. Sadawi uh, from this podium. So uh, it's a joy to be back here. Uh, sun is shining, and I am bullish oil and bearish gas. Just to position myself vis-a-vis uh, -vis my, uh, uh, I almost said roommates, but we weren't <laughs> quite that close in the past. Uh, Antoine took a fair amount of time. Uh, he went over an awful lot of things, and he took that much time because he knows that I don't agree with most of what he said. Uh, Catherine, I agree with many, many things that she said, especially the, uh, the, the, the volume trading, uh, sorry, the volatility arguments and the way that markets trade technically with the optionality of the chain and so on. Uh, I'm more bearish, more explicitly bearish gas than probably Catherine is uh, in the United States context because there is quite so much of it and we're learning day in day out how to produce it at a lower cost. Um, and so yes, we'll export LNG and just to also put that on the table, I don't think that uh, nuclear restarts in Japan are going to be much of a change or a, a, a risk to my oil market view. How do you frame uh, all the uncertainty in oil markets, uh, especially in North Africa and the Middle East, is I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that the moment that uh, I go back to my day job, which is forecasting all this stuff, uh, and I am tempted to use a rational actor model for some of the decision making that goes on, particularly in sovereign oil producers, uh, I lose, right? Uh, this is not about the rational actor. This is not about substituting oil out and gas in in a market, as was correctly pointed out this morning in the Middle East, uh, where that million BTU is valued at 75 cents. Uh, it's probably not about Aramco going solar. Uh, it's really about fundamental change, uh, both on the supply and the demand side uh, in the Middle East and then uh, in Africa, that is going to lose my market in the medium term. Uh, in the longer term, oil will suffer from a decline in demand, uh, as several other banks and institutions have pointed out. That's a very long time away, uh, and probably quite a few trading generations away. So three points very, very briefly. Uh, number one, uh, we can all disagree about our respective oil balances. Uh, mine has probably a few fewer missing barrels at any one point in time, uh, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, what we no need to know about that oil balance, we found out again uh, this summer, as Catherine pointed out, Saudi Arabia produced more than it produced at any one point in the last 32 years, and yet we had to draw inventories where we can measure them of crude oil, and we were, we were less able to build uh, our product inventories than we normally are. Uh, things are really quite tight. Uh, where in the United States investment uh, community and by extension in many corporate boardrooms, uh, the world of oil is seen as one in which we can add supply relatively easy like through fracking a bunch of uh, uh, source rock, um, where in that view uh, demand is falling away because uh, Chinese growth is suddenly going to fall away. Uh, I think that that argument is fundamentally flawed and the data are showing you that the trend growth in global oil demand uh, leaves aside uh, the cyclical downturn in the OECD. The trend growth in emerging market oil demand is determining the trend growth in global oil demand is up. Uh, we do know what oil demand is doing, it's growing. Uh, and we are going to have a real problem slowing that growth down, particularly in emerging markets. If it goes down to 3% per annum, maybe we have a shot at keeping oil prices in a range in the next two, three years. Uh, on the supply side, the very simple observation has to be that in a world in which oil prices now uh, are above $100 uh, a barrel Brent for the third year in a row, negating the argument that 2008 was a bubble in a world in which next year, five-year average oil prices, i.e. the kind of stuff that us economists consider to be normal, are going to cross over $100 a barrel in some such world. The, uh, the, the industry where it can invest is not producing liquids growth outside of North America, period. Right? Uh, and yes, Brazil will 
bring some oil to the table at some point. Point of fact is uh, that they're about five years late and they're going to be five more years before it's going to be really significant. So uh, we have problems on the supply side, meaning the demand growth that is a trend, uh, and we don't really know how the issues in sovereign oil producers are going to play out in the next two years, 20 years, or uh, multiple generations. Thank you, Jan. Um, all of us like balances that actually add up and agree. Um, there's a term called missing barrels that I particularly don't like because my name comes up almost Wait, immediately it. when it, no I didn't, it, it appeared in PIW back in the 70s at one point. But the importance of being able to have a better look at the stuff that we haven't measured before and there's this joint organizations data initiative that's trying to collect data from the non-OECD countries, and a number of us are working with that and trying to, to use it. But the basic truth that we've seen in, basic, in the last two years is that these are not missing barrels. These are, this is not a surplus because they're all finding a home. And it's probably in the infrastructure, as was mentioned by, uh, by Antoine. So um, I have a couple of questions for the panelists, and then we'll, we'll uh, ask, uh, we'll have a little bit of time for your questions as well. Doing this 13 years, there's one thing that people want to know coming out of this meeting. Uh, what's the price of oil going to be? Well, this is short term and medium term, so I'm going to ask each of the speakers um, what they think prices are going to be, at least qualitatively, higher or lower, uh, in December of this year. What are they going to be in December of 2015 as a start? Now, Antoine is going to say prices are going to go up and down, but not necessarily in that order because um, that's what he's allowed to say. Uh, but I think the other two can, uh, can probably answer that question. Catherine? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I, I think that knowing what we know now, we're in an 80 to 120 universe for, for oil. Our forecast for next year is um, uh, about 100 to 110, depending on what crude we're, we're talking about. And in 2015, I, I think that we will still be oscillating around $100, plus or minus. Okay, let's, let's decide that the price of crude, as we've been told early, is Brent. It's not WTI. Um, if we want to talk about the differentials, that's a whole different set of things, which gets into logistics that uh, Catherine was mentioning the importance of. Uh, Jan, on a Brent basis, where on, do you come out? On a Brent basis, uh, we have a, a published forecast you can find on Bloomberg, um, $110, 2014. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, by default, you find yourself adopting this rational actor model or pasting in this ration, rational actor model uh, over your supply side, uh, which is why uh, we have 100 bucks in 2015 and a long run price of 90. Tell them that they go up and down, but not in that order. <laughs> they go up and down, but not in that order. There you go. <laughs> uh, my price is $95, just to give us some range on a, on a Brent basis. So I don't think 100 is quite as magical. Um, I'm not convinced that the war between the greediness of, uh, of service providers and uh, the onrush of technology is going to come out in favor of the, uh, the plumbers, as, uh, as Christophe de Magerie calls them. Um, I think technology is going to be helping. I think the spread of the technology we already have uh, certainly in parts of the U.S. will move around the U.S. Where it goes after that, very much of an open question, very much about above board, but also a very important question. Um, what are the wild cards that are really bothering the three of you? And then we'll get to the audience. What could go wrong? Are you more worried about the upside or the downside? And what is it on the upside if that's your worry? Or what is it on the downside that that's your worry that you consider to be the biggest wild card? Oh, Jan's going to answer yeah, first. How long do we have, right? It's uh, uh, on the supply side. Just on the supply side, my biggest worry That's is enough. which one of the which one of the sovereigns <laughs> in the Middle East is going to fall over next? Okay, right? Algeria, uh, Iraq, um, go further south, Nigeria, uh, Venezuela, right? Put that, turn it around, and we can talk about who can who can grow more, and that probably would uh, be Venezuela quicker. Uh, but on the supply side, there's a lot to worry about from a sovereign perspective. Uh, on the supply side, the technology and the cost, that's all wonderful. But how many rigs do you currently have drilling this new technology in places where you're going to have to get oil from next, right? Very, very, very few. Access to the resource, the politics. Now, the politics are, the, are also uh, a big deal in East Africa, 
where Uganda now has oil, where Kenya has water, where we need pipeline stability, peace, and so on and so on and so on. Endlessly worried about that. Uh, but really, you've got to worry about who is going to persuade people as they get richer that they cannot use oil for transportation. There's simply too much demand. Okay. Well, Catherine? Um, I would agree that uh, supply is, is the biggest risk and that I'm more worried about the upside. We said at the beginning of this year that uh, we could be wrong on the demand side by several hundred thousand barrels a day in our forecast. We could be wrong on the supply side by several million barrels a day, or several, you know, and that's what's happened this year. Um, just for the sake of balancing Jan's bullishness, I'll throw out two bearish risks um, that, that I'm keeping an eye on. One is uh, the currency effect on the oil price for many emerging markets countries. Over the last several years, we've seen the dollar rally as emerging market currencies have faltered. And uh, over the last few months, they've taken another leg down at a time when oil prices were rising. So that means the effective oil price in countries like India, for example, has just gone up substantially and is well above $120. So while we haven't really seen a big impact on nano ESD demand growth yet, that's something I'll keep an eye on. Uh, one other bearish risk, I think, is, um, to put it broadly, gasoline. As the U.S. crude slate gets lighter and lighter and uh, U.S. gasoline demand is almost certainly in structural de uh, decline, uh, I do wonder where all of this gasoline will land. And so far, it's landing pretty nicely in Latin and South America. Um, but if demand growth there doesn't hold up, then I think we could see U.S. refiners start to look a little bit more like European refiners. So struggle to produce enough diesel uh, while at the same time getting rid of all that gasoline. Well, I'm going to say something that might get me in trouble. But you know, we, we think of uh, political risk as something that's in non oecd countries, especially in the Middle East or North Africa. But I think there's also some degree of risk in OECD countries, and particularly in terms of regulations. Um, yes. I don't know if I need to elaborate okay. on this. No, I think that's, that's pretty safe but instructive. Um, my risks are on the upside on prices because I usually have a supply forecast based on what I call normal conditions. The real world, when it's not normal, is bad rather than better. Um, my particular worry is Iraq. Um, with Syria next door, Syria is not over. I mean, this hasn't all been solved, and we can be optimistic and whatever. Uh, but there's a lot of things going on in Iraq internally with the Iran Iranian influence in the south, with uh, some uppityness, let's say, about the Kurds, the, the Kurdish situation and things like that. So I think Iraq is something that has to be watched very carefully. And I think uh, uh, Sam Salome will have some things to say later in the conference. So with that, I'm going to stand up here so I can see better. Uh, where are my microphones? OK, I got one in the back. Uh, any questions for us? Yes, Albert. Identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, Albert Helmet, Gray House. Um, I'm just wondering, with upside risk, if you will, in price, where do you think the price goes to that creates demand destruction? Is that 120, 130, 150? Where, what does that line come into your thinking? Uh, Catherine, you want to start on that? Um, well, a, a sort of unscientific number that I've thrown around is 140 to 160. Um, and, and if you think about that as a refined product price and, and build some amount of cracker margin into it, then that's probably a crude price of like a 120, 130. But um, I, I think particularly in the non-OECD, it's very difficult to draw a, a really straight line relationship between oil demand growth and price. It's, it's just not a very clean relationship, certainly not as clean as it is in the OECD. So I'm always a little bit cautious to, to put a number on it, but when I do, that's the number I use. Antoine? <coughs> well, just to say that the price that affects demand is, is not really the dollar price, it's the price in local currency. Exactly. So we've seen big swings in currencies in, uh, in some non-OECD oil importing countries like India, for instance. 